Hi, today I'll show you how to fit this tow bar uh, onto a Land Rover Discovery Sport for a total cost of £175, which is about the cheapest uh, reasonable quality tow bar that I could find. This is what the tow bar is going to look like. It's a fixed tow bar uh, supplied by Tow Trust Tow Bars. There's only a small cut in the under tray, no cuts to be made in the actual bumper. A uh, nice square cut, minimum opening, easily coverable. If you ever take the tow bar off, uh, it has one of the best um, towing weights and nose cone weights 175 kilogram uh, nose weight, two and a half tons, 2500 kilograms towing capacity. Uh, so, the tow bar itself 156 pounds on eBay. I'll put some links in the description. Uh, 19 pounds for a universal bypass relay kit comes from the same place very substantially uh, made very thick metal as you can see here very substantial cross beam looks very strong massively strong end parts uh, this one is made by tow trust tow bars made in england uh, it looks very nice quality actually at uh, a very good price so we're going to fit this uh, onto the car here the discovery sport uh, so it doesn't have a spare wheel, uh, it doesn't have any cage underneath or anything. So what tools do you need for this job? Well from what I can see we have 19, 22 and 24 millimeter bolts and nuts. So ideally you want some sockets with a torque wrench and to hold the other end of the bolt then either a spanner or a duplicate set of sockets. I would recommend using a torque wrench because all of the torque settings are defined for the tow bar on the instructions. Uh, there's the assembly diagram, some instructions that go with it for removing the bumper and installing the tow bar. These are the three size bolts that we uh, have that supply with the kit, M12, 14 and 16. And the first job is just to assemble the individual parts, follow this diagram and assemble the nuts and bolts so the letters on here correspond to the different nuts and bolts. One more thing I quite like to use for safety critical applications like this one is to use a bit of thread locking compound Loctite 243 on the thread of the bolts. Not essential on this one because all of these nuts are nylock type um, nuts. See there's a bit of nylon around the end which stops them from undoing but a bit of thread locker on as well will make it uh, doubly safe but that is optional. So I'm not going to show putting every single nut and bolt on. A locking washer, flat washer. And that one goes in the central position. Use a couple of the bolts just to roughly hold that in position. And we just do up the nuts and bolts like so to the specified torque. Which for these M14 bolts was 150 newton meters. That is quite a lot, which is why you do need a torque wrench. So for these metal nuts, we do of course have to use a spanner because we can't get a torque wrench in there. So we just use this quite strong adjustable like so. And uh, that's how it all looks assembled. Just got to note that the smaller washers used on these bolts and nuts and the larger ones are used on uh, the rest of them like these. So it should be eight bolts left to go upward, upward in these holes. This unit goes into the chassis member so it's all suspended from below by those eight bolts. And so on to fitting the tow bar to the car. Here are the instructions. Uh, pause that and read that at your leisure if you haven't uh, got them or if you want to have a look at them before actually buying the tow bar. So here's the car. Uh, so briefly, it is removing the light clusters, removing the bumper, taking off some wheel arch or trim or putting back some wheel arch trim from here undoing a few fixings, lowering the exhaust, and removing the tow eye, uh, removing some under tray, uh, mounting brackets, doing a bit of trimming, um, basically then fitting the tow bar and reversing. So first, we'll remove these little panels here, on each side, which allows us to get to the back of the light clusters. Uh, by the way, while I'm doing this, one of the reasons that I went for a fixed uh, tow bar rather than a removable one is um, because most of the time you're going to leave it in place anyhow. It's a little bit cheaper 
and um, you don't really want somebody else removing your tow bar because the actual tow bar end parts are quite expensive. So in here is a fixing, this thing here, which we use a screwdriver to undo. So we'll do that and see what happens. And what that does is allows us to undo it. And after pulling back the trim a little bit, the whole light cluster is able to pull back like so. And then we push on that little clip, I think. So, and it removes. And then virtually same the other side, took the panel off, but actually undoing this screw here uh, is makes it a little bit easier because you can then remove the whole panel. It's interesting, I have a few fuse box there, but there's the light fixing. So we undo that again. That fixing removed, loosen off the seal. Oh, the light cluster comes off. Pull it apart, like so. And while we're in this general area, we'll undo some fixings on the rear bumper. And then there's this press on one, which actually you can just do by your fingers, like so. It's a press in plastic fitting. And of course, the same the other side. And apparently, we have some fittings behind this plastic trim, which you can just pull off. Like so, these plastic trims, the end slots into the plastic here. So on refitting, you want to pull that out with some pliers or something. Make sure it slots back in to the plastic trim. You probably see better on this one here. This one's come off with the plastic trim, but they fit on sideways. Won't pull it all the way, but basically comes off sideways. Push it back on. It should be in that position. That one, that blue one, we'll have to move later. So pull back a bit more. And here you see we've got access to, I think that's a 10 mil bolt, which needs to be undone to release the bumper. This screw will need undoing to release the mud flap. So to get that screw off, uh, you've got to take the wheel off. Uh, find a very short uh, posi drive screwdriver, or as I've done, uh, get an old screwdriver end, put it in a vise. Bend the end round, you really want one of those rather cheap screwdrivers made of softer metal where the uh, metal bends a bit easier to do that. So one of these spanners with a ratchet end makes this a little bit quicker. And also to attach the parking sensor if you've got these. So it looks like you have to squeeze the end bit in order to get it off. Probably helps to put a screwdriver behind it to squeeze where my Four finger is, is here, and at the same time push it with the screwdriver. So we've done the same on the other side. And then we remove the lower cover on the rear bumper, which I remove like so. Best with a socket and a ratchet. So once the bolts are off, uh, removing the top fixings requires a little bit of a wiggle. Pushing side to side, pulling a little bit, but as you can see, it does come off and it's just held in with uh, just sort of push on clips. Put that to one side. And then it reveals more fixings and bolts that have to be removed. A couple here, and one more here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So undo all those and also remove this bolt just near to the exhaust pipe and just behind the mud flap is another little bolt which you can just about get to and here I've actually just undone it just about enough space to pull that up and the same two lower bolts on this side of the car one here one again hidden under here and there is one hex headed bolt that you need to unscrew just inside the mud flap here slightly easier which is to put a hex key on the bolt and inside the wheel arch use a 10 mil socket with a wrench and that's a bit easier to get it undone that way and in fact once that inner screw has been removed then getting this second bolt out is a bit easier because you can move and the mud flap out the way a bit more. That's this top part of the bumper I pulled out already, as you can see here. So you need to pull it 
this way. You can see how it clips in. So we can show how we do that on the other side, hopefully. Like so. Here's a bit of a tug. So now we're in a position to remove the rear bumper, hopefully. And it just comes away like so. And then there's a little wire at the other end, I believe. You just also having an assistant glamorous to hold assistant. the bumper. Yes, glamorous assistant. Right, so in here is a connector. Right, let me just squeeze, I think, that little plug thing there. Wiggle to apart. They're quite stiff. Probably a bit of swearing involved, pulling them apart, but that's how that works. The whole bumper then detaches. It's getting a little bit dark now, I don't know if you can see that. And next we have to lower the exhaust. The easiest way to do that is with uh, the undoing of up here. Yep, there we are. These 10 mil bolts, which are positioned this where my socket is pointing. Uh, need a short socket, just pull that, uh, or rather push that inner wheel arch and lining out of the way. Then you can get your socket up there to undo it. Uh, one of these each side. Got a jack underneath the exhaust, something like that. There's a nice plate there that joins the box to the pipe its weight. Uh, once you've undone these bolts you have to lever off the bracket that comes away fairly easily and then just lower the exhaust down onto the jack like so. Okay we're back to daylight again so that was about two hours worth to get to this sort of position with the bumper off and just two more things to remove this rear structural beam which held on by these bolts here so we need a 15 mil socket wrench to get those off which we'll do in a minute and then there's also the under tray to get off and then we can start reassembling the tow um, bar so let's get these off i don't think it should be too difficult no not too much talk so note there is a sensor which is probably like a crash protection sensor airbag sensor or something it's attached to this torsion beam so what I'm going to do is just release a couple of these plastic clips which we can just push out I believe from the back and pull out from the front that will hopefully give us enough slack so that we can just put the torsion beam over to one side without pulling on the wires too much bolts are out should be able to just lift that off I think we need to lift it up to release it off this clip here, I think. Yep, there we go. And the other side. So just about enough slack on this wire so it doesn't interfere with it too much. So next we remove the under tray by I believe I'm doing uh, these nuts in these positions here, one here, one on the other side. And just undo them by hand. Not very uh, tightly done up at all. And similarly, these ones probably do just by holding the socket. Yep. That's a six right underneath. Split either side. Then with a bit of wiggling, this under tray just drops off. And then actually there's three more things to remove. These mounting brackets, which are held on by these couple of nuts. Uh, this tow bar, or rather tow hook attachment, which undoes with these two bolts here. And then the other mounting bracket, which is right over the other side there where I'm pointing. So not too much more to go. So these bolts are 18 mil bolts, by the way. I'm pretty stiff. You have to put a fair bit of effort into getting these ones off. And then 
We just lift out the toe eye. So that is replaced by the spacers that actually come with our toe bar. And now we can start assembling the toe bar. So these spacers from the toe bar kit go into where the toe eye was attached with the holes lining up like so. So to check that the holes line up, just put one bolt in, a screwdriver or something in the other hole, make sure it's lined up nicely. So the tow bar is all ready to fit, but we've just got to do some trimming of these uh, mounting brackets that we've taken off previously. The instructions are a little bit confusing. Uh, the before and afters seem to be a bit mixed up. Uh, but the gist of it is, the position of this bracket is something like that, I think, where it goes in the motor on the car, so you can sort of compare that to that. And uh, basically anything from here backwards on the mounting bracket is uh, not required anymore and in fact this bottom part this bolt sticking out is obviously going to foul against the tow bar so basically we have to cut off the bottom of the bracket and when you see it actually fitted the bottom of the bracket is in danger of being slightly lower than this piece of the bodywork so we'll actually cut it so that's no longer the case uh, same the other side as well and to cut it you need to use a disc cutter and I'm going to use some of these very thin nice uh, stainless steel uh, cutting discs with some headphones and eye mask uh, I'll put some links for these things in the video description so just to show how the cut has been done this is the left hand side or near side in the UK uh, so there's the cut there's the bit that we chuck away because this is how it roughly relates to the tow bar when it's on the vehicle so the mounting bracket doesn't interfere with the tow bar and similarly on the right hand side of the vehicle again this is how it's been cut this bit we discard and this is how it basically relates to the tow bar so they don't foul and because we've cut into the metal we'll give them a coat of rust proofing paint i'm going to use some of this hammerite metal paint that i'm driving the garage can be painted direct to metal to stop it rusting that's the bracket mounted back on the vehicle and the other side and now it's useful to have an assistant to hold the tow bar while you get a bolt through at least one on one side and one on the other. It's quite a heavy tow bar. So that's with the tow bar roughly in position. Just one bolt either side is enough to hold it. And uh, just start getting them up. Put all the rest of the bolts in. So four bolts each, each side. One, two, three, four. And uh, once I've got those initial holding bolts in with the other ones, I've got some thread locking compound on them as well. Not essential, but something I like to do. So on these bolts, by the way, got lock washer, spreading washer, and this is how they all go in. So now we're into reassembling for the right torque. These, these are the torque figures for different bolts. So those eight main bolts that support the tow bar are M12s. Uh, so it's 130 Newton meters. We've got to do those two. So we set our torque wrench. If it's got newton meters 130 uh, this one is in meters kilograms and it's about 13 or so uh, meters kilograms so then we just do our bolts up in turn so before refitting the under tray we've got to make this little cut as shown a figure two there hopefully you can see that so there's 100 mil 110 mil hole that is basically cut out of this middle section here just to zoom out show you that do that next and refit it so we can use our angle grinder again to do that and there we go well I'll keep that in case we ever need to refit it and then when refitting the under tray, it's actually best to slide it in from the side, I believe, like 
so easier to get over both the exhaust and the tow bar and then once we've got it in that position just a matter of raising up and refitting the nuts and here we are the next day so there's another two hours spent yesterday so four hours in total so far uh, so we've got it all refitted uh, the rear beam the uh, undershield uh, cover all the nuts back in place and uh, I think that is the correct orientation of the uh, inner wheel arch lining with respect to this undershield same the other side and the cable clips back in position there uh, we've got to get the cabling for the uh, electrics for the tow bar in place and I believe there was a little hole which we can see underneath which we can get through with the grommet on it maybe something like one of these holes up here you can see a little rubber grommet through that hole let's see if we can zoom in there well, of course first we've got to get access to the boot floor so lift up our shelf and this rear plastic panel just pulls off hold on the clips it comes off like so see these little clips in nothing can detached then we can pull out the foam support tray there's the electrics which we'll connect to later for the tow bar convenient uh, so I guess what we could do is pop through a hole in this grommet here or possibly this grommet doesn't really matter which one and I think this one is slightly closer to the tow bar electrics so I think we'll have a look at this one Let's see if we can pull it out here we go yeah and there we see a hole all the way through to where the tow bar is and so we poke our cable from our trailer socket through the hole from underneath uh, take the bung make a little cross-shaped incision in it and then we can poke our cabling through it and then reinsert the bung there we are refitted so now we've just got to run the cabling over to where we're going to put our electrics and the box and so on to now fitting uh, this seven way universal bypass relay uh, here's some of the instructions again with it the wiring so we just follow this color code uh, for these wires here's the end stripped off hopefully that agrees with it we've got the yellow blue Yep, everything looks to be correct and uh, just wire it up in that order into the uh, output slots of this unit. So that's quite straightforward. Just need a little screwdriver there. Strip off the ends of the wire, uh, wire stripper, side cutters, or a scalpel. Uh, if you're using a scalpel, mind your fingers. Uh, rotate the wire, just cut into the insulation while rotating. Bend it over both ways, break off the plastic, give it a pull, like so. And then give the end a bit of a twist. Or use some side cutters like this. Gently press on the end, pull it off, and also strips off, like so. So twist all these ends together. I also quite like to bend it double, makes it a bit more mechanically secure like so okay that's those done and the white one on here has to go to a ground connection so we've got rather convenient chassis ground points here and uh, I'm not a great fan of these connectors but it makes it quick and easy and if you're inexperienced or haven't got the kit for doing soldering then it's probably the easiest uh, also makes it easy to remove them without leaving too much of a mess uh, so we need to slide this connector onto one of these suitably sized ground connectors and since the connector cuts into the wire we don't need to have uh, the end of the copper exposed the end of the wire exposed so we just poke that through the connector now uh, and get it in like so and then what we do so we'll just put our pliers around it grab it 
that pushes the metal of the connector down into the wire and hopefully the plastic locks at the same time so just need to make sure that the plastic locks over the other side like so and there we go so what you might be able to do is to test whether you've got a good connection get your multimeter like this one uh, if it's got either resistance range or a little beeping connectivity uh, testing range on it I don't know if you hear that it makes a very faint buzz uh, you can then test whether your wire is properly connected onto the cable so one side onto the chassis and where the wire is poking out there you can poke the probe in the end and you can just about hear a little beeping sound so that shows that's connected so again i'll put links in the video description for these things i say only about five five pounds uk pounds dirt cheap very good universal tool to have for this sort of job because next we've got to find where our permanent live feed is on this socket so we put it onto 20 volts range make sure it's on the voltage input not the current input and then probe around the back of this socket so you've got the copper all exposed and eventually you'll find this one reads 12 and a half volts so this is with the ignition off so this is a permanent live feed so now we've got another connector onto this one to connect our little box which has to have power uh, go back to the wiring diagram uh, here we are which has to have power supplied via a fuse onto the 12 volt input which is this input over here on the box and in the kit comes comes this little wire connector with a fuse fuse goes in back in there put that in after you've done the connection and similarly before just squeeze that around the wire like so and make sure the wires are secure and if you want to check that they're actually connected uh, put the fuse in and then again here's a multimeter to test for a connection between one end of the wire and the other and the other way of connecting to these ground terminals is to use these crimp type spade or uh, rather ring type connectors uh, so poke the wire in the end make sure the copper is exposed poked in just about the right amount through into the metal and if you've got a crimping tool use that otherwise just use a pair of pliers to give the end a good squash make sure it's nice and snug on there and then take off one of these 8 mil bolts and put this on the shaft of the bolt like so so according to the instructions you then splice your um, 12 volt supply into a permanent live which is the purple so use one of those connectors to connect onto this one uh, that would be the correct way of doing it one thing I did notice is this because this bypass relay is an electronic circuit it does take a little bit of uh, permanent power um, consumes current uh, consumes about 14 milliamps all of the time uh, if perhaps your car is not very well uh, used um, bear in mind that it's a slight drain on the battery all the time over a month on a let's say a hundred amp hour battery that's taken about 7% of the capacity of the battery over that month. Uh, if you want to avoid that, uh, you could. Uh, it's not my recommendation because uh, my recommendation is following instructions. But you could tap into one of the circuits on the fuse boxes over to the left here. Uh, take the fuse, position it inside the fuse area. Uh, and I've tested one of these lower fuses here. Uh, it's a 20 amp fuse. If we take off the live side and to test which is live pull the fuse out and measure the voltage on one side then the other the live side will be the one that has 12 volts on it with the fuse out uh, and then you could probably squash a wire in between the fuse and the actual connector and then take that wire to the fuse these bottom ones 
uh, seem to only come on when the ignition is on which means then your trailer uh, circuit and your trailer lights will only work with the ignition on uh, which uh, if that's the only time you use your trailer uh, then it's fine if of course you park it up overnight and want to leave the lights on or something then wire it up to permanent life so I'll leave that up to you but my recommendation is follow the instructions so I just looked up in the manual what these fuses are and I'm going to take it off actually number two this is FD2 FD2 rear seat uh, heat heater right side so it's a nice um, not very important fuse circuit you have a thought it's probably better on these connectors to squeeze it with the pliers with the plastic cap removed first and then you don't risk squashing plastic cover or cap and you give that a good squeeze and then just bend the cap over to lock it in place like so so next to check which wires we connect from our bypass relay into the connector in the loom so I've got the ignition on indicator indicating right and from my multimeter it seems like the green wire is going up and down in voltage and to test that I plug in a trailer board or in this case my bike rack into the socket the power and earths are all connected so here's our power the white wire is the earth and just take the green wire poke it into the end so it connects onto the metalwork and here the beeper going just hold it in a bit better and you hear the beeper going and indeed the right hand flasher is flashing so we can now connect that permanently and for the side lights the only signal that is high when the side lights are on is this uh, what's that green and brown and you can use either the brown or the black wire from the bypass relay to connect to it and when you do that you can see both let's do that both the side lights come on and uh, that's with the brown as I say you can use the black instead if you want it has the same effect so we'll just disuse the other one so that's it all connected I didn't connect the grey and the black and the blue one is the fog lights uh, for my trailer board it hasn't got fog lights uh, it's just got brake lights what happens is, is when you put the fog lights on activates the blue wire that actually turns on the brake light bulbs in the trailer board which is okay so try and tuck it all out of the way uh, bits of tape or cable ties then you've got room for reassembling with the uh, foam and the toolkit like so and then back on with the plastic cover yeah good push so it goes back into place now we're going to fit the rear bumper check you've uh, got these foam rubber pieces in place uh, if they were like mine I might be wet and have shifted position both sides once the bumper is in place they'll be held hopefully in place so first we'll reconnect that connector on the right hand side make sure that clicks and then start to align the bumper so that these tags go in the right slots. Uh, so it's useful to have an assistant to hold the bumper. Can you start moving it towards the vehicle please? Gently. So you've got to make sure all these tags go in the right slot. Make sure your foam hasn't shifted down there. You get a hand in to sort it out if it has. That this edge in here goes on top of the metal. So that plastic under tray should go behind the bumper like so. And similarly behind it on the underneath. And then once all the underneath is all lined up correctly, Hopefully, we can just pull this last edge back into place. Which is a bit tricky. 
because it now has to stretch a little bit. I need to get this top one in first and I think what we'll do is just get a little screwdriver to help push the plastic from the back. So we'll pull on the bumper, use that to bend out that plastic clip. Use a screwdriver to bend that plastic clip just a little, just enough to get it into the slot, like so. And maybe a little help on that one as well. Let's see if we need it. No, actually we didn't. And a little help on this one just to bend that plastic fraction. Mind your paintwork. And suddenly on that one. And there we are. Back into place. Time to do up some nuts and bolts. So just a quick reminder about reassembly. Got eight bolts around this back area holding the rear bumper on and connecting it to the under tray. We've got two bolts, one there, one behind the mud flap, which you need to fit before the screw that goes in here behind the mud flap, that one there. Actually, it's not screw, it's a bolt with a 10 mil nut inside the wheel arch. So reminder, get a socket behind the liner, get your hand in there to hold the nut do it up while you hold the head of the bolts with a hex key. Uh, the wheel arch liner, I believe, goes like this in between the mud flap, in between the mud flap and the bumper. Uh, don't forget to don't forget to connect your parking sensor. Make sure the clips are in place. A plastic clip there. A Phillips or positive drive screw there, and of course the same the other side. And to get this uh, trim panel back on again, see it's got a little hook there, which obviously you need to bend up to slide it over the edge. Make sure all these clips are lined up, which they are. And then just give it a firm push. Like so. There we go, it needed a bit of a firm push on that one. And there's also a screw here, Phillips screw again, which you can put on with your bent Phillips screwdriver head. And actually, I think that arrangement of the inner uh, wheel arch liner is probably best for keeping mud out from inside the bumper. So, with it sandwiched in between the mud flap and the bumper over around here, and then just flipping out, I don't know if you can see that but the inner wheel arch liner just uh, overlaps on the outside of the mud flap. That stops mud going inside the bumper. And then the final job is to refit the trim panel. Just pushes on the top and a couple of bolts that hold it underneath. It is here and the same on the other side. And there we are all finished. So you can see how neatly the tow bar pokes out the end. Extremely uh, strong, thick pieces of metal. Only one little cut in the lower part of the trim panel. No cuts to the bumper. And uh, yeah, looks all right. All right, that's everything fitted. Lights back on, all the bolts in place. And there's the tow bar. One last point, I actually measured the height of the tow ball and according to the EC directive shown here, the height from the middle of the ball to the ground should be between 350 and 420 millimeters. And when the tow ball was mounted in the top position, it was about 450, so a little bit off. Uh, of course, that was, uh, that's Beckett's for a laden, fully laden weight. But nonetheless, I've lowered it down into the bottom position and that gives room to use the uh, top holes for a protection plate, like this one. 
a nice strong bit of steel protects your bumper from the front of the trailer going a little bit too far forward when you're mounting it and inevitably uh, even though you might try hard not to you end up damaging the bumper so it's a good idea to have this has a convenient little hook for attaching your safety cable as well so it's a good idea and I'll try and put a couple of links in the video description for those parts as well the extra bolts and the protection plate okay thanks for watching again